Welcome to Q&A with the Contrarium. I'm Mark Milkey, president of the Aristotle Foundation for Public Policy. The Aristotle Foundation is a new think tank in Canada, and we hope to launch officially later in 2022. However, in the meantime, we're going to give viewers some previews of issues and people we'd like to talk with and work with and meet over the coming year and beyond. Today, I'm going to interview Waller Newell, professor of political science and political philosophy at Carleton University in Ottawa. Waller is the author of several books. His most recent ones, and perhaps very timely given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, is a 2016 book that I reviewed entitled Tyrants, A History of Power, Injustice, and Terror. And uh, his new book that will come out in May from Cambridge University Press along the same theme, uh, but expanded to uh, the recent century, uh, recent two centuries, Tyranny and Revolution from Rousseau to Heidegger. Uh, again, that'll be out in May from Cambridge University Press. Welcome, Walter. Good to be with you. So, Walter, why don't we start with where we are today? Um, preparation meets opportunity, as someone said. And your, your book is, a, both books are perfectly timed. One was ahead of its time in your most recent book is going to be perfectly timed given what just happened in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. maybe that's where we should start is with that question, Vladimir Putin and the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, are we in a new age of uh, autocracy and tyranny around the world? Or did we just take a bit of a mental vacation uh, for the last 20 or 30 years uh, from history uh, to paraphrase uh, Francis Fukuyama? Yeah, well, in my last book, Tyrants, which I think came out six years ago, I said that in the temporary abeyance of terrorism in the form of ISIS, that a new axis had coalesced, which I called the 21st Century Anti-Democracy League, led by China, along with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. So I think this new form of tyranny and despotism has been, you can say, nurturing itself for some time now. And it's manifested itself on a number of fronts, but none, of course, more vividly than Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine and attempt to simply possess that country. And so I think that, as has often been the case in the past, unfortunately, we may need events like this to happen as a kind of wake up call to us and to remind us that the world is not necessarily a safe place and that these tyrannical figures and their ambitions, their imperialistic agendas are really recurrent features of the political landscape and of human psychology. To follow up on that then, Waller, you didn't miss the rise of Vladimir Putin, um, but a lot of people did. Uh, or at least his the sort of tyrannical side of Vladimir Putin. I mean, George W. Bush famously said what I, you know, I looked into his eyes, I could see his soul or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, there were others. Uh, the Germans certainly seemed to have no problem with cooperating with uh, the Russian president, even after his, one of his first warning signs, perhaps back, what was it, 2008-09, where he cut off natural gas supplies to Ukraine in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, he invaded Georgia, um, parts of Georgia. He's been in Ukraine before. Uh, so none of this is new. Um, but this time there, there seems to have been a response. But uh, in your view, what did Western leaders, almost all Western leaders, uh, except perhaps former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who I understand helped get uh, Vladimir Putin ejected from the G8. Um, what did most Western leaders and others seem to miss in the past decade and a half that they're only realizing now? What led them to to not understand the kind of man that Vladimir Putin was, is. I think what we missed is what we miss so often, which is that we see these figures through the lens of our own views of the world. And our view of politics, and especially international relations, is greatly shaped by what we call the rational actor theory, according to which even aggressive personalities like Putin will ultimately be satisfied with a bigger slice of the economic pie. And so I think when people like Condoleezza Rice, for instance, met Putin, she saw in him a kind of cool-eyed pragmatist and tough bargainer, but someone who at the end of the day would come to terms. 
Now she says he th she thinks he's undergone some kind of breakdown. Well, I would respectfully submit that Putin was that man all along. The seemingly cool-headed pragmatist that she met actually harbored within him the grand geopolitical strategy which he is now trying to act on. So I think the problem is that no matter how many times we're reminded that tyranny exists, we tend to be lulled by the comparative success of liberal democracies into a feeling that somehow that's all a thing of the past and that everyone is no, is solely motivated by economic self-interest. I think it was John Kerry, didn't he, uh, at some point in the past couple of months, I think it was, unless I'm thinking of a previous episode of, uh, you know, where, where the Russian autocrat um, engaged in some, ab well, uh, anti-democratic behavior, yeah. illiberal behavior. Was it John Kerry who said something to the effect of, uh, what is this, the 19th century? Um, why why should Kerry have been, I mean, the answer to that is, well, yes, and it's the, it's the 18th century, and it's the, you know, 5th century, and it's uh, the 3rd century BC. Uh, I mean, we can go on and on. So why would a man as intelligent as, as John Kerry, I mean, one can agree with his politics or disagree with his politics, seem to think that uh, somehow invasions and, and war without uh, rational reason in terms of economics were a thing of the past? Again, I, I, I think it's this widespread conviction that somehow history must have progressed, that it's simply not possible for us to relapse into the barbarism of past wars or 19th century, 19th century imperialism. But I think that neglects the fact that history runs along different tracks mm -hmm. for different cultures and different civilizations. And it's by no means self-evident to me that a Russian like Putin views history or the progress of history in the same way that we do. Well, is there someone, not, not someone in particular blame for this, but are there thinkers in the past 30 or 40 years that you would peg as perhaps um, indicative of this belief? Because my, my view of politics is that politics, you know, politicians, even dictators perhaps, uh, but but in Western liberal democracies, anyway, we respond to the popular will, uh, you know, with periodic elections. Uh, Democrats, anyway, Democratic politicians end up responding to the culture in, in which they're swimming, and the culture is influenced by the culture of ideas. And often, or sometimes, anyway, that can be academics and others. I was a young undergraduate student at the University of Alberta when Francis Fukuyama published *The End of History* in *The Last Man*. Uh, first as an essay, I believe it was in 1989. And then as a book, I believe it was about two years later. And it was perfectly timed with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, right? Um, the freeing of Eastern and Central Europe, the collapse of communism. Um, and, and so it did seem to be the book for that time. And he did seem to make a cogent argument uh, back in the late 80s and early 1990s that, look, there doesn't seem to be a competitor to liberal democracy. Um, now, at that point, most of us weren't thinking about, say, Islamism. Um, Islamic terrorism. I mean, we did have the example of the 1979 revolution in Iran, but that had faded perhaps by 1989 and, and in the celebrations we observed in Eastern and Central Europe. So um, was Francis Fukuyama not only, you know, completely wrong, um, he never said historical events would stop, wars would stop. He just didn't think there was a competitor to liberal democracy, if I recall his argument correctly. Um, are, there, are there elements of his thinking that are correct then and now um, or did he miss the boat completely on on every almost every argument he made back then? I wouldn't say he missed the boat completely, but like a lot of people, he thought that the final conflict between these two superpowers, with their differing versions of modernization, would result in an outcome whereby one of them would prevail over the other, and it turned out to be the West led by the United States. And on that thesis, all forms of more minor subsidiary conflict should have boiled away when that victory took place. But in fact, what we began seeing almost immediately was that when the great superpower conflict was over, all kinds of forces that we had thought had been pretty much eradicated, religious sectarianism, ethnic sectarianism rebounded. And, and in fact, you might say they, they rebounded with greater energy than ever before. In, in the case of the Soviet Union, those energies had simply been repressed by force. Uh, 
but we somehow persuaded ourselves to believe that they were now historically outmoded. But then again, as I said, they came roaring back. Nationalism so, in particular, you mean here in ethnic uh, rivalries? Nationalism in particular, or I remember, for example, we, we all, I think, remember when the Taliban began dynamiting precious Buddhist artwork, statues in a piece of territory where they had coexisted peacefully along each side, peacefully alongside of each other for centuries, which means that in a way you were getting a new kind of a new kind of road warrior nationalism, which was simply based on hatred of the other. Road warrior nationalism, I, I like that. That's a compelling image, actually, and that exactly almost describes the Taliban in Afghanistan at that point. And that was just, just I think, it was it weeks or months before 9-11, uh, that particular bit of evidence that uh, the world hadn't changed as much as we hoped. Um, this is a good segue, perhaps, then into your, uh, your 2016 book, um, which I have in front of me. It'll also be up on the screen, but Tyrants, uh, History of Power, Injustice, and Terror. Um, there we go. Uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, can you describe, and then let's go back to Vladimir Putin, but describe first the three types of tyrants that you, uh, that you write about in, in that 2016 book, Tyrants. So I start with what I call garden variety kleptocracy. And these people have been with us since time immemorial, going back to Hero of Syracuse, forward to the Assads, to the Somozas, uh, uh, and these are people basically who run an entire country like a mafia don, as if it were their own property, and they use it to enrich themselves and their cronies. That's the most straightforward, self-evident category of tyranny. They've always been with us, and they probably always will. The second category I call a tyrant as reformer. And this is more complicated. And I'm thinking here of people like Julius Caesar, of the Tudors, of the benevolent despots like Peter the Great, Frederick the Great, Napoleon, some might say Kamal Ataturk. And the reason it's more complicated is because they of course want supreme power, glory and riches for themselves like a kleptocrat but they genuinely see themselves as carrying out benefits for their people. They often see themselves as the ally of the common man, and they want to advance their meritocratic prospects in life at the expense of the old aristocracy. They invest in huge public works, schools, libraries, and so forth. And therefore, you go back to a figure like Caesar. He was absolutely despised by the old remaining senatorial aristocracy, but many of the humble folk of Rome worshiped the ground that he walked on. And you see a similar syndrome with many of these leaders. Same with Napoleon. He evoked tremendous fear and loathing on the part of the established order, but also tremendous loyalty uh, on the part of those whose reforms he was hoping to improve people's lives by. And the third type is what I call millenarian tyranny. Now, the first two I mentioned, kleptocracy and reformer, they've always been around. But I would say that millenarian tyranny is unique to the modern age. And what I mean by this is that beginning with the Jacobins, you had a movement to, in effect, bring about heaven on earth, a kind of secular apocalypse in which all of mankind would enter a collectivist bliss of complete freedom, equality, no private property, no alienation, as the Jacobins called it, the return to the year one, a kind of primeval golden age. And starting with the Jacobins, to bring about this golden age, some offending class, whether a racial enemy, a national enemy, a class enemy, had to be eradicated, right? So with the Jacobins, it was the Aristos, the bourgeoisie, the church. And you find the same syndrome, I would say, carrying on beginning with Leninism, the need to eradicate the Kulaks, with National Socialism, of course, the need to eliminate the Jews. And so to me, this is something that is new to the modern age, 
and it's also unfortunately been a recurring motif. So can you go a bit more into that? Um, what what led to the millenarian uh, tyrant? I mean, was it was it um, the weakening power of of religion of faith in certain Western societies? I mean, I, I'm not sure what uh, uh, France was pretty Catholic in 1789, yet you had these young revolutionaries. So uh, what, was it a specific subset of people in a society who, you know, don't hold, uh, you know, they're not bound by traditional views on anything or the, you know, the traditional currents of, of history and of humanity and of, you know, home, hearth and, and, and whatever, you know, whatever you, you want there. Um, they're, they're sort of detached for that from various reasons. Is that part of it, um, at least in Western uh, societies over the last two and a half centuries? Yes, I think that is a part of it. And I think another part of it is a thorough detestation of liberalism and the Enlightenment that begins to set in with Rousseau. In other words, liberalism had hardly gotten off the ground with the Glorious Revolution and the American Revolution when a whole new group of thinkers pronounced it to be absolutely the most loathsome condition that had ever been brought about the bourgeois. Rousseau was the first person to use this term in a pejorative sense. The bourgeois represented something ghastly, something dis despiritualized, something debased, something greedy and materialistic. And I think that a part of what you're seeing there is a reaction against the tendency of the modern age through thinkers like Hobbes and Locke to reduce the meaning of reason to utility. And that set into motion this syndrome whereby people who thought that life had been drained of everything most noble, patriotism, manly ardor, courage, virtue, self-sacrifice for the common good, these are now revalorized as irrational and they're defended as irrational. And that's, I think, a really combustible potion because you get, starting with the Jacobins, again, a kind of perverted heroism, a kind of perverted sense of manly manliness that is really indistinguishable from nihilism and which always leads to violence. So is this also connected because in, in, in your book, Tyrants, you note this kind of aesthetic vision that some of these millenarian tyrants have. Um, you know, the French, you know, revolutionaries and perfect equality, uh, the same for 1917 and the Bolsheviks, you know, communist Marxists. Um, and also this aesthetic sensibility of, of purity, really, right, which you note even, I mean, you, if, uh, you know, correct me if I paraphrase your, your words wrong from, from your 2016 book, but uh, Adolf Hitler and other tyrants, um, how did you put it, morality as they see it, right, um, or purity as they see it. Um, and we see this again in Iranian theocrats when they take power in 1979 in Iran, um, this, this devotion to a pure religion as they define it. But it's really almost a strong aesthetic sensibility and a weird, um, really uh, perverted sense uh, as well, is it not? I mean, the notion that Adolf Hitler, that he had to cleanse Europe mm -hmm. of not only Jews, but other people that he called undesirables. Um, because he believed in this pseudo-scientific, anti-scientific notion of race purity. Uh, but it stems from almost an aesthetic vision of, um, they have their own, you know, definition or, or vision of purity. And it's not, uh, it's not that of, you know, um, it's not that of Rubin or, you know, other Renaissance painters, but it's their own vision of, of, of a pure world. Um, is that uh, a big part of it as well, that uh, Rousseau forward, they, they just, uh, the reason they despise uh, the bourgeoisie, the reason they despise the middle class and merchants and others and the church is because they don't see them as beautiful. They, they see commerce and the Industrial Revolution, at least later, as polluting this pure world um, that in Rousseau's case anyway, he imagined from his youth or remembered or recreated from his youth. Yes, I, I, I call it the aestheticization of violence. And as you suggest, it is a vision of society in which the collective is like a work of art. Mm -hmm. And you may remember that, that Stalin famously said, I don't want to be an engineer of factories. I want to be an engineer of human souls. Right. Mussolini praised Lenin as a sculptor of human nature. And all the way back to the French Revolution, 
alongside the terrible carnage of the terror and the bloodbath that it caused, you had these so-called virtue festivals where people were dressed up in ancient costumes and they were parading with flags and playing instruments and singing hymns to virtue and freedom. Or look at the fact that with the Soviet Union, you early on had a great filmmaker, uh, Eisenstein, I think that was his name. Yeah. Uh, and then with Hitler, you had Leni Riefenstahl. And in both of these cases, these filmmakers, in a way, tried to choreograph revolution and, and make it into an aesthetic spectacle. So yes, there's always been this peculiar connection uh, between revolutionary violence and the desire to beautify life, not simply through contemplating a work of art on your own, as somebody like Schiller recommended we do to make our lives less barren in a commercial world, but to actually literally fashion an entire people or all of mankind to make them into a beautiful work of art. Mankind becomes your canvas and you you paint onto it or create on it whatever you wish, including with the blood of those um, you know, you're murdering in the meantime to you know, put it on the canvas, I guess. Um, let's segue then into your, your new book, Waller. Uh, so Tyranny and Revolution, Rousseau to Heidegger, published by Cambridge Press, com Cambridge Press coming out in May, uh, in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, I assume, so worldwide. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, or a lot about this. So Rousseau to Heidegger, um, is, is that uh, sort of starting where we, where we were just at in terms of this notion of the, um, the revolutionary and, and how that leads to tyranny? Is that an extension of your 2016 book or an entirely new thesis? Well, my first book, Tyranny, A New Interpretation, sort of marched up to the edge of Rousseau and millenarian revolution, but it was mainly about early modern, like Hobbes versus the ancients. But I did say there'd be a sequel. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote the Tyrant's book, which was meant for a general readership. Mm -hmm. And there I did attempt at a full history of tyranny, including millenarian. Now with this book, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do a somewhat deeper dive in scholarly terms into these millenarian thinkers, but I'm also going to connect their views directly to political events. And so I'm going to try and do justice intrinsically to each of these thinkers, mm. Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, and Heidegger. But then I'm also going to ask whether and to what extent their thought did give rise to extremist political movements and sentiments. So I'm trying to strike a kind of fair balance. I don't want to say that any of these thinkers is simply reducible to a revolutionary movement that invoked their name. So I'm not saying that Rousseau is nothing but the Jacobins or that Nietzsche is nothing but fascism. But at the same time, I'm not flinching from looking that question right in the face and asking to what extent did their views and perhaps the extravagant rhetoric with which they expressed them almost inevitably lead people like Robespierre and Hitler to cherry pick in their thinking and transform it into propaganda for their movements. Can you give me an example uh, from Heidegger, for example, um, or Rousseau or both of their influence upon later tyrants? Sure, I mean, Hegel, for example, directly attributes the Jacobin terror to Rousseau's influence. Now, you can say that's a misreading of Rousseau, I think to some extent it is, but he believed that the Jacobins picked up on phrases like the general will, the general will can never be wrong. The notion that property is somehow theft, that the origin of civil society is exploitation of the have-nots by the haves, and that inevitably, again, they whip this up into a rallying cry for violent action. In the case of Nietzsche, think of phrases from his works like the master race, the triumph of the will, a thousand year kingdom, a coming battle for global, global mastery. These are all in his writings. And again, the Nazis made use of them for their own propaganda. Heidegger, of course, was an explicit supporter of national socialism. 
In the case of the other people, you can say, well, we, we can't know for sure what they would have approved of. We don't know that Marx would have approved of Leninism. We don't know that Nietzsche would have approved of Nazism. But we do know that Heidegger approved of National Socialism, and he committed himself to it wholeheartedly. And I believe that that was not just some sort of whim or accident by by an ivy tower an ivy tower intellectual who didn't understand politics I, I think that his commitment to national socialism was intrinsically connected to his own philosophy in the 1930s okay i'd like to dive into that that idea of the the general will um war um because to me this this is a good example of uh, at least for me, I'm baffled by those in the 20th century, you know, and I started thinking about this in the 1980s as, you know, a teenager, but in, and in the 1990s, when there were still people that defended communist regimes around the world, and they would use the language of, you know, the general will, right, from Rousseau and others, um, or this notion of the masses, uh, speaking on behalf of the proletariat. And um, to me, it always seemed, um, I mean, silly would be too light. We, but they didn't seem to like do any deep dive into this, this concept. I mean, um, Central and Eastern European regimes along with the, the Soviet Union and others uh, claim to represent the masses, claim to represent the general will to use Rousseau's phrase uh, and claim to be democratic. And I guess that's where they could put in, you know, the East German Democratic, the German Democratic Republic, right? East Germany. Um, but it, it, it amazed me that uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of pushback at the time, um, or they didn't seem to realize, uh, listen, somehow what, this, it's almost like a mystical term, this, this idea of the general will. Mm -hmm. Somehow you as a, as, a, as a great leader, in quotes, are divining um, the will of millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of your citizens, um, and therefore you alone or you and your comrades, uh, you and your collective at the top, somehow know uh, really what people think and feel deeply inside. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so to me, it just seems silly in the West where we had working democracies where uh, they were, of course, imperfect because you can't represent, you know, I don't know, 300 million people if you're in the you know, United States and president. Uh, mm -hmm. What you can do is you can cobble together coalitions and muddle your way through uh, history. But this idea of the general will that, that um, apologists of past tyrannies and perhaps now invoke um, I mean, what is your sense of how they, do they even think about the absurdity? Uh, because really they, they almost have to be mystics. And again, what they have to have godlike powers in a God they probably don't believe in. So how do they, in your view, how do they escape this absurdity of the general will? Um, you know, since I, most of them that defend uh, tyrannies or at least in the 20th century couldn't possibly have believed they were mystics. I think it goes back to Rousseau again, and I think this is a trait shared with him by Marx, Nietzsche, and Heidegger in, in different ways. And that is the notion that we once were communal beings. We had that blissful collective, and it was stolen from us by capitalism or by the Enlightenment or by modern rationalism, such that things like individual liberty, the right to acquire property, representative government, in their view, these were actually distortions introduced into the human character that robbed us of our original feeling of spontaneous communality with others. And I think you have to have that conviction. Mm -hmm. You really have to believe that what we would consider modern liberties are a terrible, terrible agony that, and distortion that has been inflicted on the human character in order to be able to believe that if you just smash it and get rid of it, bliss will come flooding back. And I think that people like Marx certainly believe this in a sincere way. You know, people always say, well, why didn't Marx talk about what a future socialist state would be like? Why didn't he talk about the problem of leadership? Mm. It's not that he didn't know about those things. Marx could actually be, be quite a brilliant political analyst. It's just that to him, after socialism, if you're still asking those questions about power and rule and authority, mm. 
you're still back in the class system. You haven't really made it to socialism because socialism is literally beyond politics. And crazy as it may seem, and it seems crazy to me, I, I have concluded that this is the kind of fundamental starting point, right? Like there's no antecedent cause behind this one. It's just this root conviction that we're in agony now, even though we think we're free, and we have to be liberated from that false freedom so that our innate communality can come flowering back. The false consciousness. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I suppose if, if one talks to the critics or talks to those who support this, this, this Rousseau notion, um, this anti-enlightenment notion, and you point to communal societies and collective societies that sure seem more blissful and, and peace and in harmony with the earth and each other, whether you know 20 people or 200 people, and you point out that perhaps women, um, for example, uh, you know maybe didn't uh, you know survive as long, uh, have the best uh, life in those types of very communal collective societies. I suppose the same people we're talking about would simply. Um, dismiss that because again they see it as a reference to the individual who they've already sort of written out of out of their thinking here that what matters more is the collective um, yeah. and the communal kind of experience and this mystical notion of the general will as opposed to actual individuals who you know mm -hmm. who uh, love and marry and die and, and feel pain and the rest of it in their lives so uh, they just dismiss the individual I think that's right I mean Marx says that under liberalism, human beings are isolated monads. And that representative government is nothing but a gigantic sham mm. masquerading the exploitation of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie. In fact, he says that the bourgeoisie invented liberalism so that it could endow these people with so-called rights so that they could become more productive workers. In theory. Um... So in Tyranny and Revolution, um, give us a kind of a basic overview then of, of where you start and where you end and some, you know, perhaps an example or two of tyrants and, and revolutions um, and your explanations of the same. Sure. I start with Rousseau, who had this conception of our lost human nature, something that is extremely far away and which he likens to a kind of blissful state in which we lose all consciousness of being an individual self. He claimed to have experienced this once on a hike by himself and says it was the happiest moment he'd ever known in his life. He thinks all humankind once enjoyed that, but it's been alienated from them. And so I start with what an outside observer might say is, the almost insane idea that political institutions in the present can only be legitimized by a standard of nature that is virtually vanished. He does claim that there are green shoots of it left in us and you can build a legitimate state around that. But there is this tremendous revolutionary potential in Rousseau to, in a, in a way, use a wrecking ball on civilization so as to somehow bring us back to that golden age of bliss. Now, you know, what happens after that is that in, in my interpretation of Hegel, I see him as a conservative force. Hegel was not a revolutionary thinker. He was a conservative thinker. He tried to put the, he tried to put the brakes on this kind of revolutionary violence. But then you get a string of thinkers, his successors, Marx, Nietzsche, and Heidegger, all of whom reject Hegel's notion that history has been some kind of rational teleological progression toward the modern bourgeois nation state. They reject that understanding of history. They claim that history has been irrational and that it's been a history of ever greater spiritual degradation and that there is going to have to be a kind of millenarian deliverance that can only come about when the modern bourgeois age is completely destroyed. That's the basic structure of the book. Okay. Um, I did research for, for my last book. Um, and in doing it, I didn't include this in it, actually. But I, I read uh, the Unabomber Manifesto. And it struck me as uh, this was, <laughs> this was uh, you know, a romantic notion of the world, uh, perhaps that uh, Rousseau would have appreciated, right? An anti-industrial uh, 
um, screed may, or, or rant may be too strong, but certainly tome, an anti-industrial tome, the Unabomber, Unabomber Manifesto, and um, that he found his roots in, in this back to nature romantic thinking. And that indeed, you know, parts of the radical wings, anyway, I don't want to condemn the entire environment, environmental movement because I think it's done a lot of good around the world. But certainly the radical greens today have a very romantic, uh, pre-industrial, anti-industrial notion of life. Um, and the Unabomber, you know, his manifesto actually is more pertinent than ever. Um, but he too found his, his uh, roots in Rousseau, did he not? Uh, maybe that's a question you can't answer, but if you haven't read it, but. There's certainly a Rousseau and strain there, I would agree. I, I'm also struck that where these millenarian revolutions have broken out after the Jacobin revolution, they, in my view, have tended to break out in countries that had only partially tasted the benefits of modernization had not really tasted the full benefits, yet began to feel this feeling of loss of community, that, that their traditions were being eroded, but they hadn't really gotten the goods they were promised. And I, th I think that explains Russia, for example. Um, it, it explains Iran. So oddly enough, the countries where these collectivist revolutions have been carried out most thoroughly have been countries that you can say went through a kind of stalled modernization. Whereas I think that in countries like the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, we certainly haven't been free of instances of revolutionary extremism, but liberal individualism was basically sewn into the social fabric mm -hmm. going back for several hundred years that it's been a more or less successful antidote. There are, there are, of course, not cases like Timothy McVeigh and, uh, and, and the person you mentioned, but, but by and large, they don't spark large scale revolutionary movements. They're sort of like solo acts. Let's, let's dig into that a bit more though. So you say though that um, some of these countries, some of the end of Egypt, or I'm thinking you know, the, the stalled Arab revolutions of uh, over a decade ago now, uh, or before, right, where they flirted with, uh, with, with various forms of ideologies over the years, na well, nationalism and then, you know, socialism and then back to nationalism and, and back and forth, it seems like. And yet you say they didn't uh, necessarily enjoy the full fruits of modernization and then you know, went down this path as did Iran in 1979. Um, wouldn't that say then that the materialists have a bit of a point that if people don't totally enjoy the fruits, then they're gonna lapse back into these, these, these revolutions and these, these tyrannies? Um, or did I misunderstand you correctly? Because, and, and a follow-up question while you're answering that, Walter, is, um, you know, is, is Western liberalism, uh, is it possible in non-Western uh, countries? And, you know, uh, you, I mean, I can find examples where it's succeeding now in South Korea, for example, but I, I asked the question because I'm trying to piece together um, is the idea culture in the West, which came from, you know, monotheism and Judaism, or came from this notion of the separation of church and state that developed in Christian societies, right? Uh, and even in Christian scripture, give to God, what is God, what is Caesar, what is Caesar's, Caesar's, Martin Luther's refutation of the centralizing powers of the Catholic church, and then the enlightenment where atheists argued for the individual or individual rights and, and so on and so forth. Um, so those two questions together, are you on the one hand though saying that modernization and some material progress may stall or um, blunt uh, potential uh, tyrannies? Uh, did I hear that uh, correctly? Because that would seem to contradict your initial thesis. I think it can blunt it to some extent, but I also think that the feeling of the lost community has such deep roots in non-Western countries or, or, or countries in which modern liberalism did not originate, that it's a feeling so strong that I'm not sure that any degree of economic bomb will make it melt away. But even if you could guarantee Western saw prosperity all over the world, I still think there would be individuals who would, who would be motivated by this, by this hatred of the West. Uh, and, and, and so to that extent, I, I, I don't think that that's going to be totally successful in the long run. You know, liberalism is a universalistic value system. And in that sense, it's not tribalistic. It, in principle, it is open to and accessible 
to peoples all over the world. But there are powerful countervailing values and sentiments in a number of countries that really still regard liberal individualism the way that it was regarded in the West early on by its religious enemies as, as something godless, as something corrupt, as something that undermines and corrodes authority. So I, I, I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that democracy is infinitely exportable, but I, I have come to be rather pessimistic about that. I, I, I think that's where the, the second generation of neocons got it wrong. They, they, um, they, they were too heady in their expectations about what could happen. And um, for instance, I, I think Jean Kirkpatrick, had she been alive at the time of the Arab Spring, would have been against lending American support to her. I think right. it would have struck her that right. we're repeating the same mistake that we did with Iran, right? right. Like with someone like Mubarak, right. okay, you have an imperfectly democratic leader, imperfectly modernizing, so you just denounce him and get him to leave, and then something far worse sweeps in to take its place. Right, in one sense, it's a Burkean argument, isn't it? From, from Burke himself, from Gene Kirkpatrick, from yourself. Yeah. And it's that you've got to be careful not to try and perfect societies or bring them to democratic liberalism right. um, before they're ready, because they may never be ready, or they've got their own traditions. And so societies evolve uh, the moment you try and hurry them up, though, um, whether it's through Marxism or through you know the best of intentions in the West to you know try and uh, you know get them to have a focus on the individual, and in other words, imitate Western liberalism. Um, if their entire religious and, and uh, philosophical history is not that, then what are you building on? In essence, what you're doing is the same as the French revolutionaries. You're yeah. starting over at year one, um, saying we can convert Iraq into a privatized liberal democratic state with you know market freedoms and personal freedoms and freedoms for women. Um, and, right, and it's a bit pessimistic, but in essence, it's a Burkean argument, isn't it? That you've got to be very careful in your own society, never mind others, to upend the status quo because you end up with the guillotine in 1789 or 1917 yeah. Bolsheviks. Absolutely, absolutely Burkean. Although a part of the conundrum, unfortunately, is that, you know, if you, whether you're talking about Tsar Nicholas or whether you're talking about um, the Shah of Iran or Mubarak, these people are in a way modernizers, but they're hesitant modernizers. They, they take a step toward it and then they say, oh, no, no, I don't want to give up that much power. Hmm. And, and I think it's that kind of hesitant, haphazard pursuit of modernization that understandably provokes not only frustration that people aren't tasting the benefits, but also the feeling that they're corrupt and that they're tyrannical. Again, I wonder if this is deep within the culture of ideas within a society, because I was reading something on Chile recently where they voted to reform their constitution, which, of course, is put in by Augusto Pinochet, right, the dictator who uh, you know, killed the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Marxist revolution and, and government in that country in 1973, and, and in fact was uh, a thorough modernizer of Chile, really, and even gave up power. Um, wrote the constitution on the way out, I guess, and uh, gave up power in a, in a democratic election. And yet even there, um, I, I have this fear that it's gonna head back towards a typical Latin American banana republic. And I wonder if this is based in, I'm not an expert on, on uh, you know, Spanish philosophy or the, or the mindset of, of, of that culture historically, but I, I do wonder then, again, if some of these ideas, um, you know, if Burke is not entirely correct that you, you just, you can't necessarily impose from the outside or the top down uh, that these things work themselves out over time. And yet, uh, look, I mean, I suppose we could say in the West, yes, well, uh, Abraham Lincoln imposed, uh, you know, a certain uh, <laughs> framework on the South and rightly so. Um, and South Korea now is a successful liberal democracy. Uh, and I was in Taiwan about 10 years ago talking to Taiwanese opposition figures, and they would like to be their own country, at least the ones I talked to them. Right. Right. So it does seem that liberal democracy has taken root around the world in society is very different from, you know, say a typical English, you know, speaking uh, country of the last 250 years. So there are examples of where it has taken root. Uh, and yet, obviously, you know, um, you know, there are threats to that. So do you have a sense of, of um, you know, why South Korea, Taiwan, uh, maybe Chile, 
has been immune, at least until recently, in the case of the latter case, uh, to revolutionary movements or, or sliding back into what's more, say, typical of the regions they're in. I have no overarching explanation for that. There are so many contingencies involved. For example, I think the success of liberalism is intrinsically connected with religion. For instance, in the United States, even in Canada, maybe not to exactly the same degree, but I think, you know, there could have been no Lockean society without an underlying Protestant society. The two forms of individualism went hand in glove. And as Fareed Zakaria once observed, and I, I took this argument from him, you know, if you draw a map down the center of Europe with Orthodox Christianity on one side of it and Occidental Christianity on the other side of it, you're going to find that on the right hand side of that line, the prospects for democracy are pretty shaky. On the left hand side, they've been relatively successful. So there does seem to be a connection there too between, say, the Cesaro Papist pattern of authority that you get from the Orthodox Church and the failure of representative government to take root. Whereas on the Occidental side of the line, from early on, with Aquinas in particular, you have a concession that the secular sphere has a degree of independence in its own right and should not be directly governed by the church. And I don't think it's an accident, therefore, that modern pluralistic societies sort of grew up out of that seedbed. Okay, um, let's head back to uh, Vladimir Putin and the three types of tyrants. Is Vladimir Putin a, um, I mean, apparently is a billion dollar home or something to that effect. Um, uh, he seems to be a bit of the first type of tyrant, the kleptomaniac. Um, on the other hand, he seems to be, a, to be a, the second type uh, as well. Uh, he does want to make, uh, at least initially, Russia better, or he wants to you know, protect Mother Russia. So there does seem to be that, uh, that Caesar type of uh, tyrant in him as well. Um, what, what is your view of who he was, is? So I call him um, kleptocat, excuse me, I call him I call him kleptocrat reformer with a dash of the millenarian okay. for just the reasons that you said. First of all, his wealth is simply stupendous. I mean, he and his inner circle, their wealth is breathtaking. On the other hand, he came to power and he did stabilize the Russian economy, which had been subjected to the shock and awe strategy of Jeffrey Sachs. Yeltsin accepted this, tried to introduce market norms overnight. The ruble plummeted in value, wiped out the meager life savings of people who already had very little. Putin put a halt to that. He restabilized the ruble. He introduced or reintroduced a degree of state control. And I think his popularity was quite genuine. Mm -hmm. I think people did feel that he had done a lot of good for them and they liked the stability of, of that authoritarianism because it was motivated to help the average person. And I think Putin would like Russia to be prosperous as an economy. It's not that he's against that, but I do think that his burning conviction that the Soviet Union's defeat was a terrible humiliation for Russia, and that that humiliation has to be avenged not by restoring the Soviet Union, because Putin is actually not a fan of Soviet communism. He, he, he is definitely against it. But he does want to restore what he sees as a kind of Russian motherland in which the Slavic peoples will be brought back into the fold. And that does just happen to include much of not, if not all of the former Warsaw Pact countries from the Soviet era I don't think he wants to literally rule them, although I could be wrong about that because I didn't think he'd go as far in, the, in, in Ukraine as he did. But he certainly wants veto power over their, their external and even their internal affairs. And I think that this is his long-term aim. It's a kind of slabophilic utopia that he is bent on bringing into being. Well, and the Russian president doesn't like to be defied, um, obviously. Uh, he seems, I mean, Russia has not invaded former Soviet bloc countries that um, 
have not been a problem for Moscow, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if, if the leaders are corrupt or if they follow Moscow's line or both. Uh, so it seems in Ukraine's case, uh, because of, of the more recent president who refused to bow to Moscow's will, um, that was something Putin uh, didn't care to uh, abide by. Um, well, he also has this, to me, rather crackpot theory that Ukraine isn't a real country or that it's always been a part of Russia. Historically, that's simply not the case. I mean, we don't have time to go into the details, but I mean, originally the the Duchy of Moscow was a tributary of the Kingdom of Rus based in Kiev. So if anything, it's the other way around. I didn't know that. That's an interesting yeah. historical fact. Um, Let's let's jump then into a little bit of uh, the reaction in the West to uh, the latest. Would you sorry? Let me. Would you call Vladimir Putin a tyrant or an autocrat, or is it a distinction without a difference these days? In terms I'd, of, you know, I'd call him a tyrant. Okay. though that's kind of a synonym with autocrat, perhaps. Okay. Um, I'm surprised by the uh, the reaction of Europe actually to the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that it's that the reaction has been as strong as it has been. Um, so, uh, are you surprised by that? Uh, you know, the, even the reaction in Germany, which, you know, that all of a sudden they, they figured out that maybe it was a bad idea to be as dependent on Russian natural gas, uh, and oil as they've become. I was surprised and I was also thrilled. I mean, it, it seemed as if Europe had found its soul again. I mean, it's, it's including Germany, as you say, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's just been another example, I suppose, where unfortunately it takes aggression and bloodshed of the kind that Putin has inflicted to stir in people a sense of their more fundamental values. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased. And I think, you know, Putin may have made a real miscalculation here because it, it seems as if Finland and Sweden now are mm -hmm. contemplating joining NATO. There's going to be hugely beefed up military forces all along Russia's border. So in a certain sense, he has made headway in Ukraine. I, I think it would be hard to expel him from where he is now. Maybe he can't conquer the whole country, but I think he's probably consolidated his grip on those breakaway republics. But on the other hand, he's going to wake up in a world where NATO might even be stronger than, than it is. Yes, he's galvanized the West, ironically, which a lot of us thought was in decline, especially Europe. Um, a good example of this, perhaps, and here's another, I mean, back to your thesis in both books, is um, maybe I should have posed this question before the question about who Vladimir Putin is. But energy companies in the West, I mean, about five years ago, uh, or six years ago, I attempted to raise some money for uh, research into uh, what I thought was a problem, which was Europe's overdependency on autocratic oil and gas, right? Uh, I mean, not all autocracies and tyrannies are the same. You know, Qatar is not Russia under Vladimir Putin. Um, Saudi Arabia um, is uh, obviously worse than, than, you know, I don't know, well, Turkey, uh, which is slightly autocratic under its current leader. But nonetheless, um, at least in the, in the countries that export oil and gas, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Russia, there's a lot of European dependency on this. But of course, Russia is the main problem and has been the main problem for some time. Um, on this one. But I, I noticed uh, in the Wall Street Journal actually just yesterday, uh, an article showing that uh, various European energy companies and American energy companies are taking, uh, writing down some severe losses uh, of their investments in Russia, Shell, Total, Exxon Mobil. And in the case of uh, BP, what used to be British Petroleum, a $25 billion loss. So these are significant amounts. I mean, Lenin talked about what, um, lending the rope to capitalists, if I got that right, you know, they would buy the rope that they hang themselves with, or would they get that backwards? Yeah. Um, so this seemed to be the same thing happening over the last decade or so. Again, were these companies enthralled by what they didn't know, Francis Fukuyama's theory about the end of history and thought commerce and development, or did they not care? Were they being cynical? I mean, again, Vladimir Putin has been in full view for at least a decade or more in terms of his intentions, if you were paying attention. But what was wrong with these energy companies in Europe and the United States and even in Canada that they didn't see this company? And frankly, the politicians uh, you know, in our societies that have been anti-oil and gas because of their concern about carbon emissions, and yet they didn't see the other looming danger, which was the danger of tyranny. What explains their mindset? I mean, these are business people in the case of energy companies anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes said that you will find no patriots among capitalists. Mm. And I think we've all had abundant experience of that. I, I think in some ways they were enthralled by globalization. And I think that one of the fallouts from the war in Ukraine is that all of us are starting to not pin such high hopes on globalization, that in a way we may be returning to a more nation-based system of economies and that we're going to have to become more self-sufficient as economies because we simply can't rely on those global supply chains, nor can we rely on fair trade practices from some of its biggest members like China. I think another reason for this is that these people receive a conventional education and that education tells them that tyranny is a thing of the past, that we are moving toward greater and greater world peace and that world commerce will be the great facilitator of people's freedom. But again, we've received a kind of wake up call, I think. Well, it's unfortunate in the sense that I, I'm a free trader, committed free trader. I just, it makes the most economic sense. And it, it does help the poorest of the poor more than anybody else. I mean, if, if we cut off exports from say China, then it's gonna be you know, the, the poorest of Chinese who, uh, who suffer, right? Uh, or from portions of Africa or Southeast Asia. Um, so I think it's incredibly unfortunate. I mean, I've you know been in favor of free trade you know since the mid 1980s again as a teenager and watching John Turner and Brian Mulroney debate this uh, leading up to the 1988 election. Sure. Um, so I think it'll be unfortunate. But uh, you know, one supposes we could have free trade uh, you know among liberal democracies uh, at the very least. Uh, you know, even if we are you know cast a wary eye towards the tyrants around the world and say, well you're in a different category. We'll play with you as long as we think we can get something in our interest, um, but uh, you know, not Russia in the current case. Um, it, 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 it's interesting though, Mark, that um, uh, Democrats, major leaders like Chuck Schumer, um, although in general, they were very, very critical of Donald Trump when he was president, hmm. even they admitted that Trump was correct about trade relations with China that they simply had to be put back into balance, that, that it was not a good deal for the United States, so. Right, right, and I, uh, I would agree in the case of China, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't trust their statistics and I wouldn't trust their, you know, their protection of, of intellectual or, or other property rights. So uh, to be sure China's, uh, I don't know if they're an outlier, but they're certainly a good example of where you can't actually have free trade with a country that doesn't respect property rights and intellectual property rights and the rest of it. Right. Um, uh, let's uh, let's then end off a little bit. Uh, go back to uh, your most recent book. Is what um, is there one part of of your most recent book? And let me get the title again, or you can mention the title to me: Tyranny and Revolution, Rousseau to Heidegger, uh, coming out in May from Cambridge University Press. There we go. Um, Walter, is is there something that is incredibly relevant uh, in one part of the book that you that you think just speaks volumes to to us in you know 2022? Well, when I started writing this book five or six years ago, I thought it might be a kind of valetudinarian exercise. In other words, help younger people learn about this way of thinking, this historicist school of thinking that was waning in popularity. But of course, in the last couple of years, these issues have come roaring back, right? The contribution of people like Heidegger and Nietzsche uh, Heidegger's contribution to Alexander Dugan, who is Putin's chief ideologue, these have all become very, very relevant. And so I, I feel like I'm now doing something that is quite significant for the contemporary world, because I think our world is sort of dividing up into forces you might term globalism versus populism. We don't know quite what precise shape those forces are going to assume. But I mean, I think they reflect a series of dyadic oppositions in the past, like bourgeois versus proletariat in Marx or herd man versus Superman in Nietzsche. But the thing that I perhaps am most glad I did in the book was one of my external reviewers said when he, when he looked at the proposal, if you think these thinkers are so destructive, then why don't we just get rid of them altogether? So what I do in the conclusion is, 
having made the extremist implications crystal clear, I then come back and I try to say, yes, but these thinkers like Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche, Heidegger, they are an indispensable part of what it means to be liberally educated. And in many cases, including Rousseau, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Hegel, they made tremendous contributions to human learning, to art, to literature, to fields like archaeology. So I, I kind of end the book by saying that there's something that we can salvage from it. And if nothing else, these thinkers, precisely by flirting with violence and revolution, remind us of what it is. Like when we read Nietzsche, we can find out something about the characteristics that go into making these people. So even if it has a, a, a dangerous possibility, maybe Nietzsche is sort of extolling this a bit too much. On the other hand, it reminds us in a way that say reading Locke or Hume cannot, that these people have existed and can exist again. Well, in that sense, the, the um, you know, the philosophers that you read, whether it's Rousseau or Heidegger, I mean, if you read Rousseau, you understand the French Revolution. And if you read Heidegger, then you understand the Nazis better. Um, so they're valuable for that yeah. reason alone. Doesn't right. this also, though, um, I mean, it, it seems you're almost critical of Locke, and that's fine. And um, and Adam Smith, to some degree, you know, I'm a convinced free marketer and free trader. I mean, I, I think this has been generally good for you know, human development and the poorest of the poor, you know, and others and women. But um, over the last three centuries and the flourishing that has resulted, the, you know, including the monetary flourishing, which has led to the possibility to spend money, say, in art, right? If you're searching for breadcrumbs, you can't paint a painting. So you have to have a flourishing society in Florence before you can, you know, uh, you know, you have to have money before you can paint paintings, to use that, that example as, as one. But doesn't this actually endorse really the development of English civilization? Um, and kind of the common sense. I mean, if, if I understand my philosophy uh, courses quite properly, a lot of the you know European philosophers look down their nose at, at English thinkers because they didn't think them of think of them as philosophers. Um, but in one sense, they were connected to reality, and maybe that's the problem in our age. I think we're in an anti-reality age, mm -hmm. uh, whereas English thinkers, um, Locke and Burke and others, were really connected to common sense reality as, as you know, Barry Cooper has often talked about Professor Barry Cooper, you probably know that phrase from him and others. Uh, but certainly doesn't the, isn't uh, your work then, in that sense, an endorsement of the English tradition, the English speaking tradition, and the thinkers that have come through that tradition, whether in the, uh, you, know, you know, the Great Britain proper, or, you know, later, Jefferson, Madison, and, and Thomas Paine, and the others, I mean, this combination of, of what English, um, you know, English liberals or English conservatives and, and uh, you know, Americans who, who, who you know, thought very um, hard about at the founding of their country, about what was going to work to protect the individual and liberties and, and, uh, and, and the seeds that have sprouted from that. So is, it your, is that the remedy, by the way, to, to authoritarianism and tyranny is, is a rediscovery of common sense English thinking? Well, I've always thought that I, would much rather live in a Lockean society than any of the thought systems or regimes that I talk about in this book, because living in a Lockean society gives me the freedom of thought and the leisure to write about revolutionaries. I also think that at the end of the day, despite criticisms you can level at liberal democracy for its shallowness, for its emphasis on materialism, for its psychological barrenness, it is by far the better idea than, than any kind of totalitarianism of the left or the right. And so I see myself as in a way attempting to stay at my post, to mm. use the stoic phrase, to, to sound a warning from the perspective that I can do it from as a historian of thought about the possibility that the very success of our life, comparatively speaking, will lull us into complacency and blindness. But yes, as I always say to my students, you know, Nietzsche might not have been responsible for fascism, maybe he didn't intend it, but what you'll never encounter is a human fascism. In other words, these thinkers that I'm talking about from Rousseau through Heidegger, 
whether they intended such an outcome or not, or what they really wanted it to be, they certainly left themselves open to inflaming those sorts of passions. But you just can't say that of Hume. You can't even say it of Kant, actually. I mean, Kant's, Kant's kind of one of the, the holdouts against historicism. He's absolutely emphatic about the autonomy of the self. And in that way, is much more unabashedly a liberal. Um, than, than the other people that I talk about. And we, we didn't talk about this enough, and, and, and we could come back and do another session on Western civilization, maybe we should, and where it's at in academia and, and the rot uh, within uh, you know, some of the, uh, the intellectual circles today. But in essence, um, and you'll remember I, I mentioned this in my review of your 2016 book, um, it appears to me that you're saying, you know, you're not necessarily critical um, of markets or, or freedoms of the West, as you've just oh. described. What it is, is you're saying, don't be fooled into, or lulled into thinking that when you're fat and happy or another society is fat and happy, that that's the, end of, uh, that's the end of tyrants because they may be fat and happy and still want to amass power because that's another part of human nature. Uh, they simply like to lord it over uh, other people. Uh, Lord Acton's famous you know, quote, which is a cliche by now, that um, power corrupts and... and uh, <laughs> Yeah, absolute power crops absolutely. So there's there is this addiction to power um, that uh, Vladimir Putin certainly has, um, and uh, does not like he he will not be defied. I mean that is certainly uh, who he is. So that seems to be the warning from uh, one of the warnings from your books, if I interpret them correctly. That yes. um, yeah, even though we can create free and flourishing societies, uh, be aware of the wolves uh, on the perimeter and sometimes inside your own societies. I, I would add to that liberalism is not simply about property rights. Mm. Property rights are one among a plethora of rights we have, including freedom of worship, freedom of thought, freedom of expression. And as my old professor Walter Burns used to say, the United States doesn't exist because of capitalism. Mm. Capitalism exists because of the United States. Right. So we have to, I think, recover a sense of the fact that even within the liberal worldview, property rights are a pretty good bellwether. If they're flourishing, your other rights are probably flourishing as well. Hannah Arendt said that. When, right. when, when, when there's tyranny over private property, that's a pretty good indicator that there's tyranny lurking in other reaches. But by the same token, we have to realize that liberalism isn't reducible to property rights. People who say that are actually echoing Marx. And right. we don't want to invoke Marx to defend liberal democracy. No, they're making the mistake that uh, material motivations explain all. If you could give one bit of advice to say, Joe Biden and Boris Johnson, if they were sitting in front of you, uh, what would the one bit of advice be to them in 2022? Or do you not do that uh, as more of a chronicler of history and, and tyrants? My advice would be the same advice many people would give them, which is give Ukraine everything it needs to fight Putin as quickly as possible and in the greatest quantity that one can met, one can muster with, without, of course, going directly to war with Russia. But more could be done, I think. Zelensky keeps saying this, and I think he's right. More could be done. More has to be done, and sooner. Okay, thank you, Walter. And to our uh, viewers, I'll just remind you of who we are. Um, so I've been chatting with Walter Newell, professor of political science and philosophy and co-director of the Center for Liberal Education and Public Affairs at Carleton University, author of many books, but uh, uh, some recent ones relevant to our conversation today, Tyrants, A History of Power and Justice and Terror, published in 2016, and his new book out in May, Tyranny and Revolution, Rousseau to Heidegger, uh, both published by Cambridge University Press. You can get them at bookstores near you, also from the usual online suspects uh, in Canada and around the world. Thank you, Waller. And uh, that's been the first uh, episode of interviews from the Aristotle Foundation of Public Policy. I'm Mark Milkey, the president. Uh, we will look to launch in late 2022, but before then, look for more of these interviews in the future in the coming months. Thank you all for viewing.